first order of business, um, we have a couple of posts that are expiring. We, we have two year terms. Um, Brian Kirkpatrick, who should be on with us, he's currently vice president. Uh, and uh, Heidi Han Hanlon, she's currently our secretary. I think the way we would normally do this is we'd advertise an election prior to the meeting and give people a chance to nominate folks. Um, we just recently got a head chairperson of our nominations committee. Her name is Megan Culp. She's not here today. Um, so we're kind of doing things a little bit backwards, but in the interest of keeping the world moving, we're just gonna go ahead with this. Um, so is anybody interested in running for one of these positions? Pre Vice president or secretary? And if you are, feel free to unmute yourself. Yes, or chat. And so, so because what is going to happen is that I have now exceeded my term limits by a year. So I've been, pre I should have stopped being president last year, but because of COVID, you know, why do that? So what is going to happen is Brian Kirkpatrick as vice president will become a, a president and then I'll become past president. So I'll still serve on the board and assist. And then Evan Madliger, who was our past president, I guess he gets kicked off. Um, but what that means is we will need a vice president. So, and then in all transparency, <laughs> what that means is the vice president is the president elect, but it won't happen for four years. Who knows what happens? You know, you, you can be vice president, which is honestly the easiest position on the board until you become president and then it's not. Um, so. Wait so a minute, no, wait a minute. You told me being president was the easiest position on the board. <laughs> No, vice president was oh, easiest. Buddy. Seriously, vice president doesn't do anything. Like everybody else is working. Vice president you is just got, kind of biding their time. Right. <laughs> I'm sorry, somebody spoke and I didn't hear what you said. I said, you're absolutely right. The vice president does nothing. <laughs> I would do vice president again, but now I know it leads to, pres <laughs> to being the president. <laughs> Actually, I very much enjoyed being the president. I highly recommend it. I got to meet lots of great people uh, and learn about all the issues that are going on in New Jersey. So I highly recommend it. So I think what we're going to do now is if nobody wants, uh, is um, interested in, in stepping forward today for one of those positions, I do hope you consider stepping forward for vice president in the future because that, that will be the next. I don't have any snacks. Oh, I don't have any snacks. Snacks? Oh, oh, I know we didn't. <gasps> I know, Jennifer. You were like, oh, I was on you. Oh, I'm so sorry. My rabbit is digging at me because he wants <laughs> snacks. I'm so sorry. That's really embarrassing. No, that's okay. Because we normally do have snacks for you. We normally do have coffee and lunch and snacks, but not today. Um, so, Jennifer, I think because you spoke... I will nominate you to the nominations committee for vice president because you and your rabbit could be a lot of fun on this board. Hi! <laughs> now you are muted. <laughs> I got that backwards, huh? So something to consider. Maybe, maybe don't make any mistakes, y'all, because I'm going to put you on that list for vice president. Um, Jennifer, you'd be really fun to have on the board. So something to consider if you don't, if you don't want to step forward today for one of those positions, we do, we will be looking for a vice president uh, to nominate at the fall meeting. And it really is fun. And someday we will have snacks again. I mean, I actually do have a snack right here. Hearing no um, new nominees, I go ahead and launch the poll for our election. Now, uh, Beth, do you want to tell us who can participate in the election? Can everybody hear or do you have to be a member? Yeah, to participate in the election, you have to be a dues paying member or a member who's intending to pay their dues because we do have an option to pay your dues via PayPal, which when we in our next report, Min will tell us how to do that. So if you are planning like, oh, I haven't been able to pay my dues because I haven't seen you but you want to vote and you want to remain as a dues-paying member, go ahead and vote. All right. 
I'm going to launch the first poll, which is electing Brian Kirkpatrick as Wildlife Society Chapter President. Brian, do you have any words you'd like to share with us? And if you do, you'll have to unmute yourself, but you don't have to. He, this was not a surprise. Brian and I talked about this this week. He knows it's happening. All right, I got a couple more people waiting in the lobby. We'll give it one more minute. <clears throat> but so far, you're unopposed. Hello? All right. I don't see any new votes rolling in, so I'm going to go ahead and end this poll and share the results. Congratulations, Brian. Yay! Our new president. Oh man, okay, I'm done. Brian, you take over from here. You're president now. <laughs> no, seriously, thank you, Brian, so much for stepping up. I appreciate that. Um, and we'll have a new VP. Um, we will be electing candidates that we'll be, we'll be collecting over the next few months in our fall meeting. All right. So, and then our next candidate is Heidi Hanlon. She's been serving as our secretary um, for the past two years. I can't believe it's been two years. Mm -hmm. um, and so if anybody would like to run for secretary, let us know now. I know this is not the way it's supposed to work, <laughs> but hearing, oh, thank you, ma'am. That was kind of you. Hearing no, um, other nominations. Maybe we can launch the poll, Brittany. All right. This is for Miss Heidi Hanlon to continue her role as secretary. And she's done a fantastic job thus far. She's inherited a very heavy box of previous secretary <laughs> that I'm sure she reads in her free time. Um, and so this role is keeping track of the minutes and doing some communication stuff for us, so. I wonder if we should scan all those old minutes, because now we have the drive where we can just keep those documents. Yeah, probably. All right. Let me give it 10 more seconds to give a full minute for voting. So far, it's looking good. All right, thank you for everybody who voted here. What? Wow. Unanimous. Yay, thank you, Heidi. Thank you for not running away. <laughs> Congratulations. All right, so again, Megan Polk is the chair of our nominations and elections committee. So if you would like to put your name forward for a vice president or put somebody else forward, you know, that happens too, and we can talk to them, see if they'd be interested. Um, please let us know. And now I'm going to hand it over to Mib. She's going to give us our treasurer's report. Now I'm going to share the screen for her. And Mim, you'll have to unmute yourself. Yeah, can you hear me? My um, audio is not great on my computer these days. Yes. Can, okay, great. Okay, so pretty brief report here. Um, we are doing really well. Uh, our checking account, the balance stands at 895.68 after we made two professional development awards in the last couple of months. Um, Marilyn Kitchell might be a surprise. Um, she um, is the latest recipient uh, and her notice just went out today. We also awarded Mer Michelle Stanchel and I think we'll be hearing from both of these folks at some point about uh, their activities that we help to fund. Um, 
pretty much um, our only other expenses are, um, well, that's, that's it for the, for the uh, calendar year to date. So um, we're doing really well also with our Vanguard money market fund. You can see that between um, December and March of this year, we gained about a thousand bucks. And I'm not really sure what the process is for, um, for moving money around. I, I've, I've cashed out of this before when we had a scholarship mm -hmm. to fund, but I'm gonna suggest that we also cash out a thousand just to put in our checking account. We don't have to spend it, but because this is volatile, it can go up and down. Right. I'd like to kind of go ahead and, and capture some of the gains. We've been doing really well with this fund. Uh, so do we need I to vote on that or just make a motion? Motion to move a thousand dollars from the Vanguard fund to the checking account. Second. Third. I guess call for a vote. Oh, let's see. How would we vote? Could we people use the is the hand raising Brittany, feature? Can you use that same thing uh, how about, that you use for the, the how about simply anyone opposed? Hearing yep. none opposed. Good job, Brian. Right. So I will go ahead and and do that after I double check that we haven't lost a thousand dollars in the last uh, three weeks. So. So I think Michelle, we were supporting her publication of her scientific research. Yes, I have some details I will present to everyone on that. Oh, listen to me, just trying to hog all the spotlight. I'm not president anymore. Okay, should we, should we close this report at this point? I'll, uh, any, any questions anybody has about our complicated Do you just want to um, mention the PayPal option? Oh, sure. Um, we, um, we have PayPal. It's linked to our Facebook page. It's, it's pinned to it so that it always floats up to the top. Uh, you can pay your dues via PayPal. Uh, they do take, you know, a little bit out of it. As you can see, we had a few, uh, don't, a uh, few memberships that, uh, they took out what a dollar and 77 cents for all of them. So, you know, it's not like we're, you know, we don't get a hundred percent, but you know, it's, it's, it's a good, it's a good way for people to pay who don't pay through national or in an in-person meeting, or you can always still send me a check if you don't want to do PayPal. So there's uh, lots of ways to pay your dues. And when, when is the deadline for dues paying? Well, I think we kind of have a rolling, um, because national has rolling memberships. I think, you know, ours are that way too. we talked about this as a chapter, you know, when do you cut people off? And I'm not real familiar with where we're at with that. Um, you know, if we cut off by the spring meeting, um, you know, we like, we'd like you to pay your 2021 by the spring meeting. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a discussion for another time, but I guess suffice to say that we'll take your $10 anytime during the calendar year. Yeah. And I think Kendall Simon, who's our membership person might be on and I've given her some time on the agenda to speak if she wants to, but I think that we had decided to, in terms of managing the email list, so like the newsletter and some of the correspondence goes out to the dues paying members, and I think we cut that off in in the, at the spring meeting. So your opportunity to get caught up is the beginning of the year to the, till the spring meeting, unless you're in that you pay through national, and you're in that rolling. But my national dues come out in December. <clears throat> so the preference is if you're not going through national, um, then to do it at the spring meeting and then you can stay on the email list. But if Ken, when, so we'll, next we're going to go to Brittany and then Kendall. And if Kendall wants to add anything, she will be uh, free to do that. Great. Thank you. So um, just a quick recap, our professional development awards are due um, it's an application that you can fill out. You submit your cover letter and a CV and what you want to spend the funds for. There's an application available online. It's just kind of the outline of how it works. Beth has posted that in the chat. So that is the first um, item that's in the chat. The link is there. And we 
Oh, wait, no, you said. No, I sent it to you, me. but I can send it again. I'm putting it in. Okay. Um, so it's in the chat now. Um, and we accept one in the fall and one in the spring. So right now it says November and January are the deadlines. It's actually, we moved it January and March. Uh, sorry, November 1, March 1. Tried to get it evenly spaced out. So um, this year's recipients are Michelle, Michelle Stanchel. She's a mass, she has her master's and PhD in wildlife ecology and management. Her research focused on beach nesting bird management throughout New Jersey. And with this award, she will be able to offset the cost of publishing her dissertation titled Factors Limiting Abundance and Reproductive Success of Piping Plovers in New Jersey. With this funding, she will be able to meet her goal of publishing her work to inform management decisions in an open access journal. So this is gonna help improve and advance science through unrestricted access to her research. So we're happy to support that one. Um, hopefully she'll give us a presentation on her findings in the fall. <clears throat> and our second award was to Ms. Marilyn Kitchell. She's the public affairs specialist with Fish and Wildlife Service and her work focuses on white nose syndrome in the North Atlantic Appalachian region. She provi provides direction and strategy for white nose syndrome working groups and teams and is pursuing a graduate certificate in communications for conservation. She believes strongly in furthering her knowledge in ch to change human behavior in order to aid in additional on the ground conservation. And this award will go toward offsetting the costs of her continuing education in the areas of new media communications for conservation and conservation crisis communications. So she'll be using these tools to engage a larger conservation public and regional conservation issues with local execution strategies. So congrats, Marilyn. I think I saw you on the call, um, but we will have her um, give us a little chat in the fall as well. So if you have any <clears throat> opportunities that there's a cost involved that maybe you're employer or your education institution is not helping you cover, we can certainly help cover some of the costs through our awards as long as they are submitted before the deadline. And I really want to encourage everyone to apply to this. Um, we've funded a number of these that have been largely unopposed or they don't have anyone else running against them. So mm -hmm. chances are high. We like competition. We'd love to talk about how we can assist you with things and that also there are some opportunities for um, scholarships as well. And I don't know if Ted is on the line and willing to speak on that, but if you are, feel free. Yeah, you mean a Cookingham scholarship? Yes. Yeah, so that, uh, going from memory, I think that closes December 1st each year. And we usually award it sh uh, shortly after that. Last year, we only got one applicant and we had a, a panel of five people of various ages, sexes, ranges, agencies review and um, decided to not grant that um, applicant the, uh, the Cookingham Scholarship. They were a junior, so they were encouraged to apply again next year. That's where that stands right now. Thanks, Ted. And I also posted the link to that um, in the chat as well, um, on the Fish and Wildlife page. Thank you, so that's all I've got. I'm gonna hand it over to Kendall for the membership report. Sure, um, hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, <clears throat> yeah, this won't take very long. <laughs> um, just short and sweet, I guess we have 80 active members right now. Um, which is a little bit below, usually we hover around 100, but I'm, I'm hoping that more people um, will renew their membership after this meeting, because I usually get an influx after the spring and fall meetings. Um, let's see, and just so everyone knows, I get once a month, I get, um, I download an Excel file from the national page, and then, um, and so that shows me, that, that gives me a running list of all the national members, and then I compare that to our Excel file of both national and state members. Um, so just for bookkeeping purposes, it's slightly easier um, if everyone renews through the national site rather than um, 
the state site. It's not that big of a deal, but um, it just makes things slightly easier to keep track of who's um, who's an active member and who has expired. Um, let's see. And also, if your email has changed, or if you for some reason aren't getting notifications or emails, um, and and you should be, just let me know because sometimes emails change or, or as uh, the national memberships automatically renew. Like I think I have mine set up to automatically renew. Um, and your email has changed, then I have to go back and change that into my running Excel file um, and in, into our Google contacts. Um, yeah, and I think that's it for me. So it was pretty quick. All right, thanks, Kendall. Yep. Uh, just a couple more um, uh, section chapter, section chapter, chair reports. Uh, next one is Eric Schrading with the Northeast section. Okay, um, just while we're on kind of membership, I'd just like to throw out maybe a challenge to everyone to um, maybe reach out to someone in the next couple months who is not maybe a member of the Wildlife Society and ask them if they are interested in joining, maybe something we can do just in conversations with others who are working in New Jersey and doing wildlife conservation work, maybe we can bump our membership numbers up. So just a challenge maybe over the next two months, try that. Um, <clears throat> for the Northeast section, uh, just a couple highlights. A lot of this was already in the Northeast section newsletter. So I'm just gonna re rehash a little bit of what's on there. Uh, they just finished elections for treasurer and member at large. I don't know the results of that election, but there was an election for both treasurer and member at large. Uh, there was a request by NIAFWA, uh, the Northeast Fish and Wildlife uh, Agency Conference, for um, section funds to support that conference. Um, I believe that um, the section was going to provide funds, but um, there was a mixed reaction on that. Um, so uh, I'm not sure the results of that. I think it was about thousand dollars, I want to say, but I'm not positive that. Um, anyway, uh, so I'll fill you in once I know more about that. Um, the conclave this year is at Keystone College. I think that's in Pennsylvania. Keystone seems like Pennsylvania Tech College, but I'm not positive. You can Google that if you're interested in knowing where the con conclave is. Uh, the field course was canceled uh, this year. Uh, it was canceled last year due to the pandemic. Um, the plan is to start up that field course uh, in 2022. So it will continue. It's just, I don't think they get their everything together and, and in a safe way for the field course to happen this year. Um, they are searching for a newsletter editor. So anyone who's interested in patching together a, a newsletter, um, feel free to let me know and I can uh, reach out and make sure we get your name to the Northeast section. Um, there were awards, uh, the various section awards were, there was uh, open applications starting March 8th, I believe. That may have closed by now. I think it was open for a month, but um, check the uh, section um, website uh, on those awards. Um, and I guess the last thing I will mention is there is a chapter section meeting um, May 5th um, from 2 to 4. And that's basically getting uh, the Northeast section and all the chapters uh, reps together uh, in one meeting. They're, originally, they do that in the fall as part of the um, Wildlife Society annual meeting. But there was a request to have a spring meeting as well as a fall meeting um, that's affiliated with the, the Wildlife Society, uh, the annual Wildlife Society meeting. So uh, that's going to happen, like I said, May 5th. Um, I'll plan to attend, I'm guessing, uh, Beth or um, maybe Brian, if you're the president, you would be attending. But just letting membership know if there are things you want us to raise with other chapters, with the, other, with the section, uh, please let us know. Uh, and that's it for me. Thanks, Eric. 
I just had something in the chat. Um, if it's okay with you, Beth, I'm going to yield John Park just a moment to mention um, our quail study paper that was published in the oh, cool. study journal. So yeah, hi, everybody. Hi, John. Thanks, Brittany. Yeah, everybody. I mean, uh, I know a lot of you know that we were doing a, um, uh, a quail, a bobwhite quail translocation project. Um, it was part of a multi state uh, initiative. Uh, our, our friends at uh, the New Jersey Division of Fish and Wildlife were involved, Tall Timbers, uh, 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 you know, uh, Restoration and uh, Fire Ecology Group was also part of the two. After the, the, the five years of study, the first paper got published and it was published in the Wildlife Society's Journal of Wildlife Management uh, this past February. Um, I can send out the article to, to you guys if you need it. Uh, the, the title is The Landscape Connectivity uh, Influences Survival and Resource Use Following Long Distance Translocation of Northern Bob White. It's a mouthful. But um, it was a, it's a great project. We learned a lot from this. Um, there's a second manuscript that's up for publication now um, that we're, we'll announce soon. Uh, but the work, I, I think, is, is uh, something that really helps with identifying some of the issues with long-term translocation, uh, also some areas uh, for selection of translocation, selected for translocation and what really needs to happen. Um, a lot of it came out um, in this paper. So that's about it, guys, and uh, thanks. That's awesome, John. That's so cool. Thank you for sharing that. Thanks. All right, we have one last report before we get to the heart of the meeting, which is our presentations, uh, and that is from Lisa Clark. She is our Conservation Affairs Committee Chair. Um, hey all, I uh, just wanted to quickly, uh, I guess, provide one draft letter that we have currently in the works um, is Bill S2640. Um, and it's an introduced bill that Sharon brought to our attention. So thanks Sharon for bringing that up. But um, this particular bill would actually require protection for a uh, feral monk parakeet. And so this is a pet trade release um, from South America that um, essentially this bill wants to offer protection for. So some of the language that they used is um, that they want DEP to protect this species in the same manner and to the same, the same extent as any non-game species of bird indigenous to the state that is protected by the Threatened and, and Non-Game Species Conservation Act. So there has been some, you know, support for crafting a letter. Um, Brian has already provided some comments for that, so thanks, thanks, Brian. Um, the letter, uh, you know, will touch on some of the specifics of the economic cost and damage that this uh, feral uh, bird has um, pretty much uh, carried out throughout the U.S. Um, and it will also, you know, touch upon some of these ecological consequences of invasive. So. Um, there is also a national position statement that I figure we could also send along to the uh, Environment and Energy Committee uh, just so that they have that in their back pocket. Um, and I definitely welcome any additional comments or concerns um, and we can hopefully get this letter passed along. And that's I think about it unless anyone else has anything else. Yeah, does anybody have any questions about that letter, like the, the foundation of sending this letter, as with our, I think the forest one that we had sent previously, a lot of them we just rely on nationals um, opinion, not really opinion, but their, their uh, position papers. So we usually, you know, craft a letter that's specific to this state and the resources concerns in New Jersey, but the foundation and the science of it is based on the, the position papers that nationals developed. It'd be, get them out very quickly that way. If we had to do our own research, it would take a lot, a lot more time. And if, so, anyone's, if anyone's not familiar with monk parakeets, they're, they're common, I wouldn't say common, but they're present in our urban areas along, along the uh, North Jersey waterfront. Um, they are an introduced species. They build just massive stick nests around electrical transformers. They're way beyond what, you know, their normal range and it's thought that they use the 
heat of the electrical transformers to um, be able to extend their range. They're very dependent on, you know, people feeding them, et cetera, but they're cute. Uh, they're cute little green birds. They're the same birds that people keep as pets. So there's always that dynamic of uh, keeping the power on uh, while at the same time uh, understanding the cultural values of, of the species. New Jersey is not the only state that has that's considering this legislation. The state of New York is doing something very, very similar. All right, thank you, Brian. All right, thanks, guys. I think that it wraps up our uh, business meeting, unless any of the other board members have uh, issues or items they want to bring forward. I wanted to just make sure Kelly Fowler was al allowed to give any update if she would like to. She's the student chapter rep. Um, my update is that I'm uh, not in. Rutgers anymore. I graduated, so uh, we, there's actually a new president, unfortunately. Um, oh, well, I, we're glad you're here. <laughs> thank you. Sorry. We'll, uh, we'll talk with you, Kelly, to get acquainted with the new chapter rep. And congrats on graduating. Thanks. I'm going to grad school. Yay. Yay. Awesome. <laughs> glad to have you here. Well, um, thanks so much everyone for your updates. We will get ready to dive into our presentations. Um, first up, Sharon, if you wanna get set up sharing your screen while I'm giving you the intro, feel free. We're gonna have uh, Sharon Petzinger from the New Jersey Division of Fish and Wildlife. Sharon was born and raised in New Jersey. She's always loved the outdoors and wildlife and is was a budding environmentalist starting back in high school, championing the spotted owl and often scowling at people who chose paper over plastic. <laughs> when she realized she could have a career saving endangered species, Sharon proceeded to Cook College Rutgers University and got her bachelor's in wildlife management, then received her master's in conservation biology from Georgia Southern University. Sharon's been working as a wildlife biologist on songbird conservation in New Jersey for the last 20 years, first with the Conserve Wildlife Foundation of New Jersey, and now with the Division of Fish and Wildlife's Endangered and Non-Game Species Program. And tonight, she's going to talk to us about forest habitat management in a changing climate. So take it away, Sharon. Thank you for that excellent introduction, Brittany. I appreciate that. So yeah, I'll be talking about forest habitat management in New Jersey uh, in a climate changing climate. And uh, I'll touch on the trade-offs and the backlash. But first you wanna talk about what forest habitat management is. So forestry is the science of manipulating trees to produce a desired condition, right? You go from a closed canopy, uh, let me get my laser pointer. Yeah, we go. go, go from a closed canopy to a more complex, or savanna or open canopy forest and vice versa. Forest habitat management uses the science of forestry to produce desired habitat conditions. And to talk about why we need to do forest habitat management and how our forests are changing, we need to first go back um, at least a few hundred years when most of New Jersey was forested. Um, if you're like me, you know, you may have tried to visualize what our forests looked like before European settlement. And when you do, you know, is, is this kind of what it looks like to you? You know, you kind of picture the forest of today, but with much, much bigger trees, maybe gigantic chestnuts before the blight hit. Um, you know, if so, and you know, I, I thought this for a long time, but if so, you're, you're kind of in for a surprise because our forests in New Jersey prior to European settlement did not consist of that a dense tangle of huge trees covering the entire landscape. Uh, many accounts from the early settlers say that the forest was open, um, especially the oak forest, you know, oak forest and the pine, pine forests uh, throughout New Jersey. Uh, even park-like, like with only 10 to 30 trees per acre. In areas they're talking about in Boston, um, where there were thousands of acres without a tree in sight. And this is because New Jersey had standard placing hurricanes. This is hurricanes that would cause a damage similar to an F2 tornado. And this happened at least every 85 to 150 years. And you had, usually had more frequency and more severity, higher severity when you're closer to the coast. And 
these storms, these hurricanes took out at least 50 to 75% of the canopy trees. And that occurred in Northern Jersey as well as in the Pinelands. Fires also occurred regularly. Um, up in the Northern Jersey, it occurred every 20, 20 25 years or so. Um, down in, in Southern Jersey, Jersey, it was more like an average of every 12 years. Now these fires weren't all stand replacing, you know, they didn't kill all the trees, but in some fires they killed maybe 25% of the trees, other fires maybe 50%, um, but they were enough to keep um, multi-aged stands, multi-aged, to keep the savanna savannas, to keep oak forests as oak forests, and to keep pitch pine forest as pitch pine forests. And to put things into a little bit more perspective, uh, according to the accounts of early settlers, Long Island used to be a native prairie pitch pine oak savanna. And heath hens, before they became extinct, were once abundant from Maryland up through Maine. And heath hens, for those that you don't, don't know, they're a grassland shrub dependent species. And so this was all before European settlement, um, you know, the tree clearing came. So this is kind of how our forests look like. Right? So it's difficult to quantify how much disturbance there was where to paint a really clear picture of how much of what kind of habitat was on the landscape. But it's been roughly estimated in New Jersey. Um, up in northern New Jersey, we're talking about less than 7% old growth northern hardwood forests, probably hemlock mostly. Uh, we had this, this multi-cohort oak forest, which is about 25 to 40% of this landscape. And then 30 to 50% of the landscape was this open forest Young, young forest from hurricanes, and they didn't have enough information from fires or beavers to really quantify uh, how much. So there's a wide range um, in there. Down in the pylons, you had a lot more, a lot more grasslands and scrub barrens from fire, about 10 to 30 percent of the landscape, and then 30 to 50 percent of the landscape was savanna from fire and hurricanes. So it's a far cry from, from what we had thought, and when you look into the literature, the paleoecologists who study, you know, the charcoal concentrations, the fire scars, the pollen records, they agree, especially, you know, we all pretty much understand the pylons was fire adapted, but they agree that fires and droughts were common in oak hickories. And it was that, the fires, that kept oak forests as oak forests for the last 10,000 years. So now our forests look really different than what they did, the natural forest um, pre-settlement, pre-European settlement. So currently we have a scarce amount of open forest. And I'm talking about open forest as less than uh, 40 to 50% canopy. Um, and young forest can kind of tie in there because you can have a 10% canopy, it's an open forest and has young forest. It's too, you know, it, it gets a little convoluted, but that's kind of my definition of that. So, but they're scout, they're very scarce. We have less than 11% of this multi-age, semi-open, like 50 to 60 percent canopy forest in northern Jersey, and about 8 percent is an open, really open forest, young forest, and we're also lacking in the old growth. We're at, we're at less than 1 percent old growth. And in the pylons, we have about 8 percent in this grasslands and scrub barrens, and 10 percent in the open forest savanna. Now this is looking into our forest areas. I'm not talking about the agricultural and the developed areas. I'm looking at the core forest in the pylons here, and then what we have left in the highlands um, and in the Ridge and Valley up here. Now, what's happening, in, especially um, in a northern Jersey, is the northern hardwoods, the maples, the beaches, um, you know, species that are less suited to future climate conditions, to in increase warmer climate and uh, increasing droughts. They're regenerating in our oak understory in northern Jersey. And then oaks and other hardwoods are moving into the pine forests and the pinelands. And this is because of that lack of fire. And also it's because of the past land use. Now our forests are really dense and it's to the point where they're more resistant to blowdowns when we get the hurricanes that are destructive enough to um, cause an F2 damage. And 82% of our forests are closed canopy, roughly middle-aged. Uh, and that was not as common as pre-European settlement as it is now. And we see the declines in wildlife that utilize forests, the mature, you know, those who, who utilize mature forest, open forest, young forest, and scrub barrens. We see this decline. This is the Breeding Bird Survey trends for New Jersey, 1986 to 2019, with thrush up top, eastern towhee in the middle, prairie warbler down below. And 
these are species that don't have the same breeding niches, right? We have breeding in mature forest, breeding in open barren, um, open forest and barrens, shrub nesting, shrub nesting, ground nesting, and they eat different things. You know, beetles primarily on the ground and berries. Uh, their toes are also ground foragers and they eat seeds most of the other time. And then we have the prairie warbler, which is a foliage gleaner that eats beetles and caterpillars and is pre pretty much insectivorous. These species also don't share the same migratory patterns or the same wintering locations. So have with the wood thrush that breed up in the orange, migrate in the yellow, and breed in the blue, uh, winter in the blue. And we have the towhees. Um, they breed in the Northeast and they winter in the Southern part of the United States. They don't leave the US pretty much. And then the prairies that pretty much winter in the Caribbean and along the Eastern coast of Central America. So the only thing they really have in common is that they breed in New Jersey in our forests or some stage of a forest. And we find that these declines are matching the declines in the young forest. And this is based on um, habitat change analysis for barred owl habitat, which uses the core forest in the highlands and the pinelands area. And so this is the trend of young forest from 1986 to 2019. Um, one thing to note, the land use, it's based on land use land cover, which only goes to 2015. So I use the 2019, the data, uh, forest inventory analysis data up to 2019 to kind of extrapolate to see if um, young forests have increased or decreased. So that's how that graph came to be. Um, and you can see the trends do not match what is the overall forest in New Jersey. So they've pretty much made, remained stable um, while the birds have still declined. And when you look at deer, you would expect if deer had an impact on forests that there would be an inverse relationship and work with the decline in the birds and we're not seeing that either. But what we do know is that young and open forests are important for interior forest birds, for woodland breeding birds, because they bring their chicks, they nest in this habitat and they bring their chicks to post-fledging um, post to the young, and, young forest and the open forest. And then their species like golden wing warblers breed in this kind of habitat. And then when their chicks leave the nest, they go to the mature forest as long as it has an open enough canopy that there's enough of a shrub layer for them. We're also finding um, that the species that are the main food source during the breeding season, these, these caterpillars, these moth caterpillars, are supported by these tree species, these three, three, um, tree genera. So we have the aspen, the birch, the cherries, the willows, and the oaks, so the top five species that support Lepidoptera, the moths and the butterflies. And these are the same five out of the six species that are highly correlated with where golden wing warblers forage. And those species are shade intolerant, which means they need a lot of sunlight to start growing, at least 60% of canopy opening, at least. Um, and shade intermediate or mid-tolerant species like the white oak that you know, don't need as much sun to start growing into a tree, but they do need an op a semi-open canopy for that. And so when you're looking at all this, all this peer-reviewed information, um, why are people so up in arms against forest management? So I'm going to touch on that for a bit. And basically because there are trade-offs. Right? Forests provide a lot of ecosystem services, ranging from timber production and recreation, um, to wildlife diversity, plant diversity, uh, to carbon storage and sequestration. Now, unfortunately, you can't manage or not manage the same stand of forest for all the ecosystem services at the same time. That's why there are trade-offs. And if you ask people what's important to them, different people will prioritize these ecosystem services differently. So some think that land, forest, the wildlife are there to benefit the people directly and would rather see that instead of the environmental services. And that seems to be more of the traditional value that people would help um, hold. And this might be how they would prioritize the forest management, timber production over carbon storage. Others would think that the environmental services should be elevated above any other benefits to the point where land, forest, wildlife should be left alone, left to nature. And Perhaps someone like this would prioritize carbon storage and sequestration and wildlife above uh, timber production, recreation, pest control. And this would be an example of somebody who has a mutualist uh, kind of value. 
And then there are others who, you know, like me as a wildlife biologist would want to see diversity up top. And then understanding we need recreation, we need carbon, all of that stuff mixed in. Um, but, you know, it really depends on the situation. Like in an urban area, I might elevate temperature regulation. In the pylons, I would elevate stuff for fire mitigation. And this would be an example of pluralist, that it really depends on what the situation is on how we would kind of elevate our priorities or, or our values. And then there's another group that really could care less, that are just distant and, and don't care about forest ecosystem services in general. So here's the gradient that I talked about, traditionalists on the left, pluralist in the middle, mutualist on the right. Now keep in mind that people fall all along this gradient, so it's not extreme one or extreme another. Um, and this is based on a national survey. And it seems that people who lean more towards the mutualist over here tend to be increasing and are, are becoming dominant, the dominant value held by most New Jerseyans and in the Northeast. And a couple months ago, I talked to um, a couple of college uh, classes about a, and informally polled 100 college students, asked them a bunch of, a couple of questions just to see where they fell. And 90 to 95% of them fell on the mutualist side of things which means they did not support euthanizing a bear who attacked a human. They did not support euthanizing a coyote who killed a pet, although that was a little bit more mixed. And they did not support managing forests and letting it go to nature, except for uh, invasive species control. So that's kind of where we are in New Jersey. Now I started out, you know, scowling at people, choosing paper over plastic. I was definitely over here. Um, when I went to college, I learned about the importance of hunting. So for hunting, I was more pluralist. Forest management, I was more mutualist. And over time, I started you know, getting into um, the literature and it really depended on who I was working with, who I was working for, who had influence on me um, to decide like where I was in certain situations. But the more I got into the literature and the science, I am now a pluralist and I think everything related to conservation wildlife biologists. It really just depends on the situation. So people's knowledge, their values, their behaviors, they influence and are affected by the decisions that we make, you know, in the conservation for wildlife, the management of natural resources. You know, everybody has an opinion, everybody has bias. And as scientists, we need to be aware of not only our own biases, so we don't corrupt our own interpretation of data, but we need to be aware of the biases of others, our colleagues, the public, the decision makers, et cetera. And tribalism is becoming rampant these days. Uh, according to Cray, those who don't know enough about a topic, uh, instead of searching for the answers themselves, will find the answers from the groups who seem to align with their existing values, right? So it sounds good, or it's already what I, it's you know, what I already believe. So what they're saying must be true. And so when you're talking about forest management and people who oppose forest management, you know, a mutualist will tend to lean towards a local preservationist group uh, instead of looking into the science or looking into the information themselves, even if they're capable of comp comprehending that science themselves. And they tend not to challenge the statements or question what people say if it fits what they already believe. And that's where the radicals come in. So those are um, people that tend to have more extreme views on one side or the other, traditionalist or mutualist side. And what I call radicals, according to Vining, are the highly vocal local public and special interest group who garner a lot of attention. So they're the ones who will overrun the public hearings, They'll submit multiple public comments on bills and legislature and for stewardship plans. Um, they try to appeal to the emotions of the public to gain support for their cause. And at the same time, the perceptions and opinions of the rest of the public go unnoticed. They're, they're the squeaky wheel. And so, but their opinions, like they don't necessarily reflect the entire public, but because they're a squeaky wheel, um, everyone else kind of gets forgotten about. And a radical may go far as far as like harassing hunters, chaining themselves to trees, sabotaging equipment. But more often, from what I, my experience in New Jersey, 
They just put up a political fight, protest peacefully, and then badmouth all who disagree with them. Now, there are cases, I'm not talking about anyone who submits public comments or, or goes to public hearings or radicals. Now, there, there are definitely cases that you, you need to do something and, and have your voice heard. What I'm talking about, though, are the groups who distort the truth and use these logical fallacies to create a perception or at least to exaggerate a threat to sway the public and get them to react in their favor. And so some common, common fallacies um, that they use to get the public to react are distortions that polarize the issue, especially those that name a target to blame, statements that presume Ill, Ill intent, like follow the money, um, statements that are antagonistic and accusatory, and talking about it, you know, forest management is all about hunting and game animals, or they've all been bought by the forest industry or by billionaire hunters, or they're lying about the tree ages or the need for rare species habitat, and all of this without really any proof. Um, now, radicals like this tend to exaggerate the intent of those they impose. So when we talk about how we want to cut trees for habitat, they say, oh, they want to clear cut all the forests. Or, you know, we might make some money off of this that will go back into, into stewardship again. They're like, oh, they just, you know, are logging the largest trees for the money. Uh, they all, you know, people like this also tend to exaggerate and falsely extrapolate facts, things about invasive species. Like if you cut, um, if you cut it, it will, um, you know, invasive species will show up anywhere. Or, um, you know, like the bird is disappearing because of climate change. So stop creating habitat for them. Or, um, you know, things like that. And you can name it. You can talk about runoff, invasive species, erosion, anything. If you cut the trees, it will ruin the forest. And then there are statements were uh, made that where words are misused. So they um, tend to use the word pristine a lot because people have this image of what a pristine forest looks like, assume that's what they're talking about, even though the forest is not actually pristine and has been touched by humans for hundreds of years. So at the same time, radicals don't really want to get into, uh, locked into an agreement, you know, because if they do, they become obsolete, the fight is over. So they tend to raise new issues and keep the action going to keep um, people interested and to keep up the anxiety. So when anxieties are high, the sympathetic nervous system kicks in, the logical part of the brain shuts down, um, and reactions are based on emotion. And this is this is from a textbook, literally, Rules for Radicals. This is these these um, tactics are taken right out of this book, whether they read it or not, it's it's what they're doing. And it intentionally sows distrust towards the organizations that they they uh, oppose. Now, one thing to remember is that. These people are in the minor minority. And, you know, for Sparta Mountain Forest Stewardship Plan, we had a public comment period in 2016. Um, and we received over 2,000 comments, which is a lot for a forest stewardship plan. Overall, the majority of the comments, 81%, were opposed. That said, the majority of the comments opposed were from form letters that originated from just a few conservation groups. And I know this because one of the form letters that were submitted came from my cousin. And when I asked her about it, she, she didn't even remember sending it. She just clicked on a link and it was sent. And um, when you look at the information, you know, overall these, only a handful of New Jersey conservation groups uh, oppose the plan. So these groups are in the minority when looking at conservation professionals and when looking at the New Jersey conservation groups, but they did have some kind of sway over the local groups and the local public. Now, during the same time this comment period was happening, there is a user, server for, user survey in New Jersey for wildlife management areas done, being done throughout the state. And this survey was about 2,000 people uh, who responded and it represents like with the family of groups, about 4,200 people. And when asked about timber harvest, herbicide, prescribed burn and no management, you can see that more people agree for timber harvest and disagree, and very few people agree that no management is the way to go in our wildlife management areas. And so keep in mind that these um, surveys were not just hunters. 59 or almost 60% of the people surveyed were from suburban areas and were there for hiking and dog walking and non-consumptive uses of the wildlife management areas. 
So when it comes to managing forests, all of these different priorities and values are at play, right? You have the trade-offs. If you want to increase canopy cover from what we already have, yes, you will increase carbon storage. You probably won't increase carbon sequestration um, as much, although I'll, I'll let the foresters really handle, handle that because that's their wheelhouse. Um, but given our current state of forest, if we biodiversity will increase if we if we increase the habitat diversity. Um, resiliency to climate change will likely increase if you kind of open the canopy and have that diversity of habitats and, and forest ages. And we actually do have enough forest that we can kind of do it all. We just can't maximize everything in the same pl place at the same time. So if we increase our planning size or the area that we want to plan and do this, you know, maybe go from 10 stands to 100 stands, and we use diverse management regimes, we can manage for multiple objectives and simultaneously reach like 80% of the maximum for, for our, the objectives that we want. But even with that, you know, for some people, this isn't and never will be good enough. And trust, um, is one way that we can get people to, to kind of come on board with what we're doing. The more trust people have in you or us or you know, wildlife biologists or your organization, the more socially acceptable whatever we do becomes and the less resistance we will encounter. And this is why the radicals try so hard to attack uh, people who are against them, that they oppose because they want to sow that distrust um, and their actions are hurting all of us. And because of that, I don't, I really think we cannot stay silent. You know, if we're supportive of forest management, we cannot let their voice be the only voice that people hear. And that's why it's really important to be consistent and constant with our outreach and with our messaging. And to do so in a way that will resonate with different values, not just values held by one group or by our constituents, but for across the board. We need to promote the need to have that balance of ecosystem services for everybody, not just for, for the special people or for one group or two group people. Um, and we need to promote our management successes. You know, what, what we've, are, we've done work already in Northern Jersey, some pilot projects in South Jersey, we have those successes that we can promote. And if we do this, this will increase the rational trust, you know, the trust that we have the expertise as wildlife biologists, as conservationists, and that we're capable of getting things done and done in the right way. Right? But information alone is not enough to change behaviors, especially if they're reacting out of emotion. So personal interpretive outreach is way more influential than, than just um, the passive forms of outreach. So we really need to do both. And we really need to get out there and show people what's been done. Take people on the birding trips um, to these sites and show them why is this is a success. And Letter uh, demonstrated with um, landowners who manage their forest that people, the landowners who accompanied the technicians on the, the species monitoring visits had a positive shared experience and led to higher trust for NRCS and their partners. And so you do this, it'll increase, you know, the rational trust that we have the expertise and the affinitive trust. And that's the, you know, we, we get, get out there with people, they get that emotional connection and the feeling of shared value. And that's the way to start getting, getting people to come around and start to understand really why we're doing what we're doing. Um, the thing is, it's usually not an instantaneous gratification. It's, it's um, this is gonna take years, but it will change minds eventually. And finally, you know, call out the fallacies for what they are. You know, when you hear them, when you hear people say them, call it out. You know, hey, you're attacking me, not the argument. Or, you know, you're totally distorting this person's argument. You know, they don't want, they never said they want to clear cut all the forests. Um, and, you know, take, put yourself out there. You know, take a stance publicly um, if your organization allows. And you might get attacked. You probably will by them or by other colleagues. You know, anticipate it, but don't be afraid of it. And I'm speaking, you know, from experience. I've been called a, an undignified political hack. Um, my organization, as well as New Jersey Audubon, have been um, called disingenuous. I've been accused of using a smokescreen for cutting the biggest trees, 
and I've been accused of not telling the truth as a project organizer of Sparta Mountain. What I've come to learn is that these ad hominem attacks are actually a compliment because that means my stance is solid. The only way they can win this argument is to attack me personally and try to discredit me. And the other thing to remember is that they really are the minority and they're preaching to their own choir and most people who are thinking logically aren't gonna listen, but we still can't let them be the only voice that's out there. And with that, I am happy to take questions or not. Thank you, Sharon, for your presentation. There are no questions in the chat, but I see Eric Schrading has a hand raised. Hey, uh, Sharon, great talk, um, really interesting. Um, I was just wondering whether um, timing, um, or if you could maybe talk about timing of, um, I guess if you consider an issue may be controversial. Um, how timing of that to get information out about it is important uh, such that you know you can maybe uh, limit or minimize um, you know kind of those uh, uh, those those arguments maybe against a, a project you know, from those different realms. Right. So Ideally, it's best to, you know, um, as soon as you're ready to start a project, even you know when you're even thinking about it, start getting the messaging out. Start um, trying to promote that trust. Start trying to tell people what you want to do and why. Um, if the other side gets the first word in, it's harder to. Then you're kind of always playing defense. And so, yeah, getting it, getting their messages out early and often, I think is the best way to do it, even you know, before you even start a project and then continue with the follow-ups as much as you can. Um, you know, from, in my experience, you know, people are very, very passionate about not cutting trees. And I don't think that's gonna go away. Um, and we, I, for the most part, I don't think we can really change our minds. And I think, you know, the more we try to fight with them, the more we're both going to dig in our heels and, and just fight each other. What we need to do is reach the broader audience and just educate them before they even, you know, know what's going on. And just get that, yeah, get that out as soon as you can and just keep on getting it out over and over and over again. Thanks, Sharon. <clears throat> Mim Dunn had her hand raised as well. I also wanted to echo great presentation, Sharon. And um, I couldn't help but think when you talked about uh, the ad hominem, uh, follow the money, that um, a lot of times it's these groups that are that are benefiting financially from being, you know, the antagonists. So how can we use that? You know, how can we use the fact that Sierra Club is, you know, that's their rallying cry to stop the chop, and you know they're they're raising funds, you know, as of the, as a result of being anti you know, forestry. How can, can we use that against them? That's a really good question. Um, I think we want to be careful to not fall into the, the, the fallacies that they use. Like if we're going to accuse them of something, we need to have the proof. If we have the proof of that, it's no longer a fallacy, it's a fact. And so I think we have to make sure what we have is fact-based and then, yeah, make it public. And put them on the put them on the defensive, um, but yeah, if we just accuse them without the facts, that's the same thing they're doing to us, and then that'll that'll look bad. Yeah, thank you. And Beth, hey Sharon, um, I also want to thank you for that presentation. I especially enjoyed the um, the analysis of of like societal and, and people's views and 
and really just kind of seeing that rather than assumptions of what I've made about what I think people think. So that was really interesting. I appreciate that. Um, I just quickly wanted to ask, I, we've been hearing about the Sparta Mountain Project for quite some time. Are you, I know you may not be able to, but are you able to share with us where we are in the process? Will, is there a timeline for implementation potentially? Well, so we have an approved for stewardship plan in Sparta Mountain. Uh, it was approved in 2017. It is um, supposed to expire in 10 years, 2027. So we are currently implementing. Uh, we're not doing as, as much as the plan outlines, but this winter we did accomplish uh, 9.2 acres, I think, of young forest restoration. Mm -hmm. And that's about the last three years, that's about what we've been, all we've been able to do. Um, there is talk about, um, you know, an addendum to the existing plan to kind of tighten where our site selection is going to be. And there's also talk about creating a new wildlife management area plan um, before this one expires, before the current forest stewardship plan expires. So, um, you know, the, the um, both of them will go out to public comment eventually. You know, we're, we're kind of in the beginning stages of, of a future plan. Um, so that's, I'm not sure um, how long that will take per se, but, you know, so far we are able to get at least the minimum done for, for Young Forest. Thank you. You know, I, I do think there is a counter message and, and given that like a lot of people were interested in um, Audubon's, what was it, 4 billion birds lost paper, like a 25% of all birds have been lost. So, you know, what I envision is like, like a sad wood thrush, you know, like, like their message is the tree on the ground and ours is like a set, a wood thrush looking into its empty nest or something like that. Like there, there could be counter messaging, but that would, um, you know, take an investment of resources that I know your organization would not be able to do. But maybe TWS could. Maybe our new president could consider um, some new issues to focus on. All right, thank you. Sure. And next we have John Park who wanted to speak. Yeah, hi everybody. Yeah, excellent uh, uh, presentation, Sharon. Um, but, you know, two things that, that, that I, I've noticed over the last couple of years is that, you know, obviously you need stakeholder input, obviously. Um, you know, like we said, you're trying to get out before it and, and that's all fine. Um, but when it comes to these type of um, uh, negative messaging, I guess that, that the other sides are putting out there, what I have seen is that the, the folks on, on the planning side, Sharon, Audubon, uh, you know, NRCS, all these different individuals, the consistency, as long as you're consistent with the messaging and the data, it off, it, 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 it's really damn hard for these groups to kind of uh, twist it. Yeah, they might say all kinds of nutty stuff, but the reality is, is that we're, we are definitely seeing a positive, um, uh, influence, I guess you'd say, over the powers that be that actually create the rules or move these things forward because the messaging that has been put out there by the scientists, by the biologists, by, by the land managers has been consistent. And that is really the, the one thing you can never lose sight of because if you get tangled up in all the all the BS and all the, the conspiracy theories and everything else, it, it, you know, and, and I got to admit, I, I did get into that and I, it, would, it would drive me up a wall to the point of just, you know, the stress levels were just too much. But the reality is this, if you got the data and you could stay that consistent, it pans out in the end. Um, and, and that's something you can't lose sight of. To get really combative with all these folks at this point, um, yeah, I, I don't know what you what really comes out of it because I don't think you're going to change those individuals. They're too dug in. They have a uh, they have a, they have an opinion that is just not going to go anywhere else. But 
within our circles, within again, those legislators and those individuals that actually make the projects happen, that's really where your, your focus should lie. That's it. Thanks, John. Eric? Sorry, uh, one last thing. Um, and I don't know if it's more of a question than a statement, but um, you know, the need for wildlife professionals um, and including you know, uh, graduates um, that are coming out of school and with undergrads and graduates degrees, um, kind of that need for social science tools seems really important. Um, it was ages ago when I was in college, so I don't recall it ever being part of my curriculum then. It may be incorporated into curriculum now, but I'm just wondering if it's something we want to explore maybe as a chapter um, to see, you know, to have like a professional, like a uh, social science professional, you know, talk about tools that, you know, we collectively can use, because I think it's really important. We learn a lot about, you know, nutrition, ecosystem, ecology, those kinds of things. That's usually, you know, the train that we typically go to, but oftentimes we're kind of lacking maybe those um, social science tools that can help us, one, understand, but also, you know, maybe be better at, at our messaging. So just throwing it out, maybe as a statement, I don't know if Kelly, you're, you're a recent graduate from, from Rutgers, you can, you can lend uh, a voice, but um, just something I was thinking about that I think that's something that we all maybe collectively need. Yeah, I would agree. Not to say anything about the, um, the experience that I got from Rutgers, because I do think it was like a very holistic education, but I think, what you're you're talking about comes more from work experience, and I I I, I wouldn't say that we were given that education to the, the extent that it's probably necessary. So, yeah, I think if the club could um, the chapter could talk about it, it would stand to benefit every student and and you know professional. Yeah, looking back, I mean, I was not prepared for this. Um, for the public side of things, you know, I, I didn't get, I didn't study wildlife to work with people. I studied wildlife to work with wildlife. And uh, I've had to be a self-taught human dimensions person now. Um, a, lot of late, a lot of late nights reading on, on, on this topic, but it is really important. And looking back, I really wish that, you know, the colleges or universities or, you know, would, would have pushed this more. So if that's something that we can do as, as New Jersey chapter, I think we should. Hey, Eric, it's John again, uh, great point, because um, I can tell you this, from working in the, in the Delaware River Initiative, the DRWI, we actually got funding through NIFWIF to hire a social scientist. Uh, actually, the guy was from Rutgers, Dr. Ethan Schoolman, and we used him to um, better get a, ha get a handle on better communications with the ag community for the work that we were doing. And I gotta admit, I, it opened my eyes to so much more um, than what I thought I knew on how to, commu uh, how to communicate. Um, the process was really long. There was a lot of, um, uh, 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 a lot of testing and a lot of, um, um, what's the word, the uh, uh, working groups and stuff. But at the end of the day, I gotta admit, it. It was worth every penny that we paid for that guy to tune us in. Um, and that might be even something that we could reach out and see if you, you know, talk about that aspect, if, this, if, that's, if that's another thing we want to look at for future meetings. But I got to agree with you, man. That was a, that was a big time eye opener. Absolutely. And I'm curious if internally, um, you know, we talk about all these professional development opportunities, if we don't a, if we don't have someone that's applying and taking the funds, or if our Vanguard continues to do very well, is there an opportunity for the, the chapter to pay someone like this to come in and do work like this with us? And I just want to commend all my colleagues for the backlash that you faced and how professionally you've handled it. Um, I know that I am so humbled by the work that you are all doing and um, the tough times that you have faced with public opposition and, and not letting down and not you know, keeping your arguments strong and keeping at it. So thank you so much. 
in the interest of time, I would like to move on to our next presentation. I see we still have a few hands raised. I'm wondering if um, we can save those things for after our next presentation during our networking time. And if, if that's okay with everyone. But thank you so much, Sharon. Um, thanks everyone for the great discussion. Kudos. Thank you. All right. So next up, we are going to talk about the State Forest Action Plan. We have Lauren Gazerwitz and Courtney Compton with us today. Lauren's a forester focusing on climate and carbon for the New Jersey State Forest Service. She has a bachelor's in wildlife conservation biology and a minor in forestry from the University of New Hampshire. And Courtney is an assistant regional forester with the State Lands Management Program of the Forest Service. She started her full-time career with the Forest Service as a forester in 2016. Before that, she worked as a part-time forestry assistant with the Forest Service and has been working with the Mercer County Soil Conservation District. So um, Courtney is going to be sharing her screen with us if you are able to get that going. Looking good. Okay, I'm going to hand it over to Courtney. Thanks so much. All right, thanks everybody. I'm just make sure my I'm unmuted here. Um, so yeah, thanks everybody for inviting us to uh, talk to you guys about the State Forest Action Plan here today. And uh, thanks Sharon for uh, talking about the you know the importance in scientifically uh, grounded silviculture and forest management. That's definitely important. And um, you're definitely right on uh, a lot of the challenges that we've all been facing here lately. Um, so with that, we're going to get started uh, jumping in, talking about the State Forest Action Plan for the state of New Jersey. Uh, there we go. Um, so like I said, today we're going to talk about uh, why the State Forest Action Plan. We're going to go over uh, what it is and uh, cover a brief overview of kind of how the document's organized, where you can find some important information. We're going to talk about uh, some, of, some of the national priorities. Um, that the action plan is uh, based off of. Uh, we're gonna talk about how it was created, and then we're gonna go over some of the major topics uh, in detail, things like climate and carbon, and uh, things in particular that we thought you all might find um, interesting. And then we'll uh, go over some of your questions uh, at the end of the presentation. So uh, first of all, why the action plan, right? So the, the state of New Jersey is 40% forested. So a lot of people don't, under, uh, don't know that. Um, and with 40% of the state forested, right, this is very important um, for uh, knowing how to manage forest resources. So as you can see in this graphic here on the left of the slide, uh, a lot of the forest is distributed within the northwestern part of New Jersey and also the southeastern portion. And there's also a boundary of the Pinelands area there for you to have an idea of um, kind of where that is as well. And the action plan is very important because nature's always changing, right? We talked about a lot um, about climate change and how some of the, those factors can influence uh, how resources are managed and what they'll look like going into the future. And again, one of the major points is that we're a part of the land and the land is part of us. So um, these forest resources aren't stagnant, they're always changing and we're also part of that change. So just to give you a little bit of a, a breakdown of uh, how ownership plays a role in the forest resources as well, right? So we all play a role. Private ownership alone uh, is about 48% of forest resources. 31% um, of that is uh, state ownership. And then we also have uh, local government and things like uh, municipalities, counties, things like that. 14% uh, and then we also have federal ownership around 7%. So we all play a, a very major role in uh, how our resources are managed um, and how they're taken care of and how we have influence on them. Because remember, everything you do um, depends on uh, forest resources uh, for everyday life. Everything from your home to some of your computer screens that you're looking at right now um, everyday materials, recreation, and that type of thing. So it's all a major part of uh, what we do. So 
what is the State Forest Action Plan? Well, basically, it's a broad strategic vision for the next 10 years. So uh, every state is required to do this in the United States. Um, and again, it's, it's done every 10 years. So the last one was done in 2010. This will be for 2020. And then we'll have the next one in 2030. Um, and in between those uh, new state forest action plans, there's also five-year reviews. So when we have these review periods, it gives us the time to be able to monitor how we've been doing over the years and see if we're moving uh, forward on the path that we set out to uh, achieve. And one of the important things about the State Forest Action Plan also is that it's required for any type of federal funding. So if there's organizations uh, like the Wildlife Society that are trying for any kind of uh, landscape scale restoration grants and things like that, um, you have a lot better chance when you reference a lot of the things that are in the Forest Action Plan, a lot of the strategies and goals that are part of that strategic vision uh, to be able to get that type of funding. So it's important in that way as well. Um, so what is it to New Jersey? Well, it's a way of connecting local, regional, and national forest resource issues, right? Um, it gives us a set of priority goals and areas. And the action plan was specifically designed to uh, work in line with the wildlife action plan. So it's meant to mesh together. So um, we have a lot of co collaboration between um, a lot of the different groups and organizations and the public. Um, so uh, this graphic that you see on the right is just kind of an example of uh, some of the priority areas and goals and things like that. Um, so this image here is just uh, some priority areas for more of the rural forest areas. So you can see a lot of those uh, core type forest areas. Um, this image here is some of the priority areas for um, interface regions. So areas in between rural and urban forest uh, priorities. Um, so these might be like connecting habitats and things like that. And then we have some of the urban forest priority areas for uh, forest resource management. And again, the, the point of this action plan is to have a common language uh, between professionals, the public, different organizations and things uh, that we can use to talk about and um, explain where our uh, strategies are and where we'd like to go. And uh, we also want to highlight that it's, it's an all trees mission. So no matter where they are, what the species are, how they look, right? They're, they're all part of this forest resource management mission. So we need to think about uh, trees in all aspects in rural and in interface areas and urban areas, um, not just solely individually or on their own. So just giving you all an overview how the uh, action plan is kind of arranged or set up. So the first section that you'll come to is the assessment area. So uh, this goes over a uh, basic forest trends and conditions. Um, this is based on uh, the international, internationally recognized Montreal process. Uh, so it covers issues um, with forest resources, threats, opportunities, things like that. Um, again, as you saw in the previous slide, it helps us to uh, identify priority landscape areas within the state, um, but also it helps us to prioritize um, multi-state areas as well. So areas that we can work in conjunction with other uh, states, state forest action plans. So that kind of regional aspect as well. And then as you get further through the document, there's a strategy section. This is more of the uh, action component. So in this area, you'll find uh, the strategies that we're looking to achieve as a state, uh, goals and priorities, things like that. Um, there also uh, will be implementation uh, strategies in there as well, if they're known already. But we also have uh, things like data caps and things like that, that we know we need to work on. We just don't have uh, a thorough way of trying to figure out exactly how to do that yet. Okay, so these are the three national priorities that all state forest action plans are required to have and talk about. So the first one is conserve and manage working forest landscapes. Then we have protect forests from threats. 
and enhance public benefits from trees and forests. So these are the three uh, themes that you'll find throughout the document. All right, so how did we go about uh, creating this action plan? Well, as Sharon alluded to, right, we have to count on the latest and most recent scientists to guide uh, a lot of the management um, prescriptions and things like that, and a lot of the ideas for management that we want to uh, incorporate as strategies. So we looked at the latest science. This includes uh, information all across the board, US Forest Service data and information, uh, a lot of our information comes from the Forest Inventory Analysis Program as well. Um, and we used a lot of this information to analyze, interpret um, uh, with different stakeholder engagement and also public comment for what a lot of the strategies should be and what a lot of people care about. Um, so again, we had a lot of stakeholder engagement uh, throughout the process of developing the action plan, uh, various groups and things like that, municipalities, um, so we had uh, most of the plan uh, developed through, and then we also had a comment period where people were able to uh, give us feedback and things on the action plan. And that was really helpful as well. So we got a lot of great feedback. Um, so this was all about, you know, generating a lot of uh, discussion and communication between a lot of different uh, groups and even agencies uh, within the larger DEP on how we can uh, best manage our forest resources over the next 10 years. So again, next we're gonna go over some of the major topics that you can find within the uh, State Forest Action Plan. So the first one Lauren's gonna talk about is climate and carbon. Then we'll go into damage causing agents or DCAs. Uh, I'll touch on density. We'll talk a little bit about uh, biodiversity and how that's important. Um, and then we'll go into age and how that has uh, an effect on our future forests and some habitat indicators. And then we'll talk about fragmentation and habitat. All right, hi guys. Um, so the first thing that I'll be talking about is climate and carbon. And in New Jersey, as you can see in this left graphic right here, sources of greenhouse gas can be categorized into six different groups with the top three being transportation, electricity generation, and commercial and industrial uses. And out of all of that carbon that's emitted into New Jersey's atmosphere, 8% of it is sequestered back into New Jersey's forests. So this map on the right shows the total forest carbon in New Jersey. So like, it was mentioned earlier in Sharon's presentation as well, northern New Jersey and southern New Jersey, the Pinelands region, have the densest forests in the state. Um, and you can see that because of that, they also have the highest carbon values in the state. So that really dark green color in there is where most of the carbon in the state is being stored in our forests. Um, next slide. And that forest carbon can be categorized into five different pools. So we have the live above ground carbon, which is all of our tree trunks, branches, and leaves. We have live below ground carbon, which is our root systems, dead wood, leaf litter, and soil. And the soil carbon and the live above ground carbon make up the two largest pools that we have in our New Jersey forests. So we can manage for more resilient forests through acts of what we call carbon defense, which is protecting the current carbon pool. And we can do that by managing density, restoring ecosystem functions, and acquiring and maintaining forest land. Um, or we can manage through carbon offense, which is expanding the carbon pool through planting trees, accelerating tree growth, storing carbon in wood products, and also by avoiding emissions through managing urban and community forests. Um, next slide, please. So how does climate and carbon impact our management strategies? Essentially, it helps us to influence um, site choices for forest restoration. It prepares us to make alterations um, for anticipated forest pest impacts. Um, we have higher variation in weather events and rainfall and definitely for changing fire seasons as well. So you can see in this graph right here from NOAA, um, it shows average temperature in New Jersey over the past 30 years. And we can see that there's definitely an upward trend. Since 1985, New Jersey's annual temperature has actually increased by 3.5 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and next slide, please. And the same kind of goes for precipitation in the state. Um, this is again over the past 30 years. 
And while we do see an increased trend in the amount of precipitation in the state, it is very slight. Um, however, a lot of models are showing that changes to climate and changes in temperature are expected to exasperate, exacerbate, sorry, rainfall events and the intensity of those events, and also to prolong any dry periods between these large weather events. Next slide, please. Okay, so along with that, um, increased temperatures, more extreme weather events, prolonged periods of dry spells, we're gonna see increased storm severity and frequency. So New Jersey has experienced a significant amount of rainfall and weather events, especially in the last two decades. And I think the one that most of us um, have come to mind very quickly is Superstorm Sandy in 2012, um, which had rainfall and storm surge inundate over 400,000 acres of upland forests and wetlands across the state. So this photo here is actually an example of Double Trouble State Park, one of our Atlantic White Cedar stands that was pretty much decimated by high intensity winds from Superstorm Sandy. And we had a lot of other Atlantic White Cedar sites also suffer from saltwater inundation um, from that storm. So this is actually quite a large restoration project at this point. Um, next slide, please. Again, going with um, increased storm intensity and storm surge and how that can be damaging to forests. Um, this is a map of category four hurricane storm surge depth. And you can see that really dark blue is over 12 feet in storm surge. And we can kind of see that it's a little more than just coastal. So it's something that we definitely have to think about in future management plans. Next slide, please. Okay. And this figure illustrates shifts in plant hardiness zones over the past 10 years. That's the, the map on the left is all changes that we've already seen over the past 10 years. And the map on the right shows potential and predicted changes in planting zones over the next 30 years. So as you can see, as temperature zones have and continue to shift northward, it means that tree species that are more adapted to cooler temperatures in the northern part of the state, um, for example, those associated with northern hardwood forests, um, could be outcompeted by more southerly adapted species or by generalist tree species. And this concept also really applies to insect pests, invasive species, or any other species just moving northward. Next slide, please. So one of the goals of the State Forest Action Plan is to manage for more resilient forests by not letting New Jersey's forests become net carbon emitters. This map here kind of highlights the Midwest region of the state. And these downward white arrows are showing years that um, their forests acted as a, a good carbon sink, pulling carbon um, from the air into the forests. And those um, upward looking arrows on the right, those orange ones, are years in which carbon was emitted into the environment. So the Midwest over here, their forests are historically carbon sinks, but over the past decade or two, they've had a ton of disturbances, really large wildfires, mountain pine beetle outbreaks, that have actually damaged forests so much that they have become net carbon emitters overall. And even though carbon improvements have been made across the country, so when we report carbon as a country, we do it all together, not in regions or anything. This was actually so damaging that it negated a lot of the progress that the rest of the country had made in cutting carbon emissions and managing forests as carbon sinks. So it's really important for us as a state to really manage our forests for the larger landscape as well as just statewide. Next slide, please. And kind of going along with that damage from different wildfires, insects, um, we'll talk about damage causing agents, which are essentially anything that can cause harm to a forest. Um, for the most part, we deal with them in the form of invasive insects. Um, the big four in New Jersey are gypsy moth, southern pine beetle, emerald ash borer, and um, new to the party, spotted lanternfly. Um, and as you can see in this bottom left photo, um, this is some aerial photos of damage from southern pine beetle. They tend to start in one area and work their way outward. So you can see that large patch of dead trees in the back, um, surrounded by a ring of dying trees, which is where the beetles are currently attacking. And they will move their way outwards towards all of those healthy trees. Next slide, please. And damage-causing agents don't have to just be 
invasive insects that attack trees. They can also be insects that damage soil biomes. It could be invasive plants that outcompete native plants. It can be wildfire. There's a, this is a map of wildfire hazard potential in the state with the darkest red being where the, the most um, hazard potential is. Or it can even be native species that like such as white-tailed deer that are overpopulated to a point um, where it becomes damaging to the forest because they are selectively browsing on native species. Next slide, please. All right, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about density. And this is a major component of the state forest action as well. So we talk a lot about how we can uh, manipulate um, the density across the state to be able to help mitigate uh, some of these DCAs that Lauren talked about. Uh, so this graph that you see here is, uh, represents the uh, live tree basal area. So it's a, a form of density uh, this is per acre and then it's um, uh, for the forest statewide. So as you can see, we've generally had a, a pretty good rise in the amount of uh, density of trees across the state. Um, it's currently kind of, it's around about 111 square feet per acre um, and somewhere around about 430 trees per acre on average across the state as well. Um, and the average diameter is somewhere around about seven, seven inches as well. So um, when we think about a uh, southern pine beetle in particular, uh, the, the threshold that we use uh, to gauge when southern pine beetle is quite a risk is around about 80 square feet per acre. So if the state average is at about 111, um, you can imagine just you know, how big of a risk that is um, when we look at uh, some of the Pinelands areas and things in particular. So that's a, that's a pretty big difference. So we have, uh, although some of the numbers of trees are uh, decreasing a little bit, the amount of growing space that they occupy has been continually increasing. Um, so we have uh, a lot more growing space being packed with trees and utilized by trees. So a lot of times uh, this also caused uh, mortality induced by stress and also induced uh, by the trees themselves, right? So in this image, you can get an idea of what density might look like. Um, so, you know, this is a pine forest. You have a lot of uh, younger trees kind of packed into one small area and they're competing against each other to utilize uh, the resources that are there. And actually, as you see some of these trees dying off, um, they actually uh, have naturally adapted to some of these conditions. And it's also caused some of the, the gene pool of these trees to even change because of uh, this, you know, such high density um, uh, that uh, they've come into. So that's definitely something moving forward into the future that we're continually concerned about. Okay, so now we'll talk about biodiversity and we manage for biodiversity by trying to balance forest types and successional, successional stages. So essentially making sure that there is a matrix of different types of habitats and conditions available for different species, whether they be wildlife, plant or insect. So one of the ways that we can do this is by trying to expand biodiversity. Um, you can see I have this, we have this cool graphic in here, all these little square boxes. And I'm sorry, this is a very Pinelands oriented example, but each one of these squares represents an endangered plant in the New Jersey Pinelands. And you can see they kind of move on a gradient from full sun only and full sun with partial shade um, in that yellow area to that dark blue, which is full shade. And so kind of as have been referenced in this presentation and the presentation before ours, we need to expand um, different habitat types. And like Courtney was just talking about, this is really where density comes into play because we need to have different densities in different forests to accommodate um, plants and wildlife that have different habitat and condition needs. So an example of this, these two photos on the left, um, a few years ago, we did a roadside thinning um, to help create habitat for the pine barrens gentian, which is a species of concern. And the following year, it was great because we saw a rebound in those flowers. Um, we've also worked on managing habitat for different wildlife species like red-headed woodpecker or timber rattlesnakes. Um, so really, we're just trying to manipulate the forests and landscapes to create um, 
more of a matrix of different densities and different conditions. Um, next slide, please. And on the flip side of trying to um, expand forest types to um, create more biodiversity, we're also trying to maintain biodiversity. And part of that is um, due in part to all these damage causing agents that we spoke about earlier as well. So um, these four species, Eastern hemlock, oaks, and shortleaf pine have all been really negatively impacted by different invasive insects. And Atlantic white cedar, like I spoke about earlier, has also been impacted by saltwater inundation, um, a history of, of harvesting and um, storms, extreme storms. So these are species, native species to the state that we're trying really hard to restore and generate throughout the state to maintain biodiversity and to maintain those habitats that um, New Jersey native species also need to survive. Next slide. All right, so one of the other uh, important things that we talk about in the action plan as well and uh, across the state is age. So uh, in this graph here, you can see um, on average of the forest land area across the state, this is the, the general age class distribution. So you can see we have a, a pretty good bell curve here. So we have that 61 to 80 year old age class um, and that's a really big bump. So about a third of the state uh, forest land area is in that one age class, in that single age class. So you can imagine that that poses a lot of uh, concerns and risks for the future, uh, both for the forest health and habitat as well. Um, one of the things you can also see in here, and Sharon touched on this a bit as well, is that that younger age class that we see. So that zero to 20, 21 to 40 uh, year old uh, forest area, um, you know, that's, that's a bit concerning. That's, you know, a little over 5% of the total uh, forest land area in the state is composed um, in that age class. So that's something really for us to think about. And a lot of the strategies that we talk about in the action plan as well have to do with um, how we mitigate some of these things. And then uh, on the other side of the spectrum, you can see the older age classes that we have. So kind of that 121 to 140 and that 141 to 160 uh, age classes. Uh, now we do understand there's definitely a lot older trees that are around within the state, but again, this is average uh, forest uh, information for the state. But we can see there still that, you know, we have, we have a, a pretty low amount of actually um, older forest, uh, more mature forest within the state. So that's a little concerning as well. And then, um, you know, that 61 to 80 year old age class is, is gonna age all at the same time. So then we're gonna have this large bump uh, towards that older age class. So as our forest ages, we have to be able to, um, you know, accommodate for that and know how to manage for those uh, forests that are growing older, uh, especially when we're concerned about um, some of the stressors that are coming into the forest like Lauren was talking about the DCAs and things. So these are definitely some things that really we need to uh, talk about and keep in mind, which is why they're in the forest action plan. And because uh, diameter can act a bit as a surrogate for age, um, we also see this trend in some of the stand size classes across all of the forested area in the state as well. So you can see over the last uh, couple of decades that we've seen a, a pretty good decrease in the amount of small and media medium diameter uh, stand size classes. Um, so again, some of our smaller or younger forests are decreasing a bit. And then you can also see that we have a, an increase uh, over the years of larger diameter uh, stand size classes across the state. So again, we're, we're kind of transitioning into those uh, larger diameter um, aging or a little bit older uh, forest there. So definitely something we have to consider as far as future forests and um, how some of our plant and wildlife species uh, use these changing areas as habitat. Okay, so fragmentation is obviously a growing concern in the Northeast and especially in New Jersey, which is the most densely populated state with the densest network of roads. So I'm sure we're all familiar that fragmentation causes increases in edge habitat and invasive species 
and decreases in core forests and connectivity between habitats, um, loss of interior habitats. And of course, with all that, an increase in human activity that's in closer proximity to habitats and forests. So we have this graph here that shows um, spatial integrity and forest integrity across the state. And we can see that these darker purplish gray areas are the core forest in New Jersey and all these other colors represent high integrity forests, low and medium integrity forests or unconnected or fragmented. So 55% of New, Jersey's, New Jersey's forest land is considered core forest, 21% is high integrity, 9% is medium or low integrity, and 14% of our forests are considered unconnected or fragmented. Next slide, please. So as Courtney kind of mentioned much earlier in the presentation, um, the state isn't the only organization or group that owns all of this forest land. So 48% of New Jersey's forests are privately held by landowners. And the average age of family forest owners is about 60 years old. And about 50% of family forest land is in patches that are 50 acres or larger. So with so much land being held by an aging population, there's a lot of uncertainty about what will happen when that land changes hands. So in this map on the right, we have the average forested patch size um, in each county. And again, we'll see that Northern New Jersey and the Pinelands region have the most large um, habitat patches or forest patches. Whereas this map on the left shows the proximity of forest to roads. So this really dark purple color is forest that is about 400 meters away from the closest road. So looking at both of these maps next to each other, we can see that even in counties or areas where we have um, higher or larger fragments of forest, it's still really fragmented by roads and human development. Next slide, please. So how do we deal with this? What are our goals and what, how can we work to minimize fragmentation? Um, so we can evolve how fragmentation is measured, maintain, enhance, and acquire forests for higher spatial integrity, manage the matrix of, of forests for core and connecting habitat, or, tax or provide tax incentives for private landowners. And to do this, there's actually a lot of tools available to us. So New Jersey Fish and Wildlife has a program change connecting habitat across New Jersey, which provides maps that show core and connecting habitat um, wildlife corridors, roads, all of this really great stuff. And it's been really useful um, to us in kind of looking at how, how forests and habitats align and how fragmented they are and what we can do to kind of work with that. Um, maintaining, enhancing, and acquiring forests. We have the Green Acres Program, which acquires land for the state. Um, and then we also, um, to kind of mitigate the um, private landowners um, owning so much of our state forests, we have ways to provide tax incentives and stuff to landowners to try and manage their forests. So we have the Ford Stewardship Program, which provides technical assistance and funding towards the development of forest management plans with the potential for tax abatements. And we also have the New Jersey Woodland Stewards Program, which provides education, outreach, and leadership to forest landowners to share information about local and regional prescriptions and also to kind of um, inform them on how managing their property could really benefit um, local landscape goals. All right, next. All right, so thanks, Lauren. We just want to kind of go over a recap of a lot of the things we talked about. I know it's getting towards the end of the day. We've been here a while. Um, so I just kind of want to reiterate some of the things that we talked about, and then uh, we'll, we'll go over some questions. So again, you know, it's really important to consider uh, ourselves as humans as being part of the land and knowing that the land is part of us. Um, so we went over uh, why or what the purpose of the State Forest Action Plan was. Uh, we talked about uh, what it was and uh, kind of the overview of how the document set up. Uh, we also talked about the three main national priorities that are required uh, by the federal government um, for all of the state action plans for every state. We talked about how it was created, right? A lot of collaboration, discussion, and uh, communication and involvement. And then we went over a lot of the major uh, important topics in detail. So we talked about climate carbon, fragmentation and habitat, biodiversity, how density and things uh, work into it as well. Uh, so with that, we'll be happy to uh, talk about any questions you guys might have. And we're very thankful uh, for you guys to invite us uh, into the meeting to talk about some of these things today. 
Great, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. Um, we have John Park who would like to ask a question. Hey, Courtney and Lauren, uh, great presentation. Um, I my 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 one um, my one big question is that because I know when we read the draft, uh, we you know we had a lot of comments and we submitted the comments. Um, the final's not available, correct? Because it's still in review at the Fed level, right? Yes, that's correct. We're we're almost across the finish line. It's gone through uh, most of the approvals already, but yeah, we're just waiting for that uh, final go ahead. I believe from Washington D.C. until we can really put out the final copy. So, so my big question then is, how were the comments incorporated into the plan? Because it seemed like there was a very short time frame to get comments in before your deadline. So will there be anything coming out of the state as far as uh, addressing the comments? Um, like what's, what's the rollout? Because I mean, I know that there was some pretty significant things in that plan that were um, that we had questions about, you know, proforestation being one, the fragmentation uh, definition, because that has been used by uh, folks that are anti-forestry, uh, um, not understanding the concept that if you actually do silviculture, it's not fragmenting the forest, it's just changing the age, it's not going to be a permanent, you know, trees grow back. So like, I, I just... Right. I'm just trying to understand how the comment portion um, was addressed and are we gonna see those comments addressed? Yeah, so you're right. That was, uh, that was pretty tough for us to do because you know, we were on a, a pretty short timeline to get uh, all this uh, document turned in as well because we had um, you know, internal approvals that everything had to go through. So we really needed to make sure we made that uh, federal timeline. But yeah, a lot of the um, comments that came up were very important. And like you were talking about, yes, we had a lot of uh, either side of sort of the proforestation argument. So I think um, we, we handled that pretty well. And yes, we did include uh, comments from both sides. So you can guarantee that, you know, you'll, um, you know, the Audubon Society and a lot of uh, um forest resource uh, conservation groups and things like that definitely were considered with those as well. Um, but again, we wanted to focus on uh, the science-based information that was going into this state forest action plan. So that's really where we tried to uh, concentrate on uh, with the comments that came in. Um, so again, they were really good comments. Um, it made us uh, be able to acknowledge some of the arguments and things that are going on at the moment as we were developing this action plan. Um, you know, so some of those things went into it as well. And then um, to answer your question about how some of these comments and feedback are going to be addressed as the final copy rolls out, um, I'll have to talk to some of our colleagues uh, specifically about how that's going to go. Um, but I'm sure we're going to have, uh, once the final copy is out, I'm sure we'll have some more um, stakeholder outreach uh, sessions and things like that to go over a lot of what was included in the plan. Thank you. Yeah. Great discussion. Um, does anyone else have anything that they would like to say for just at the four o'clock hour? Um, so some folks might need to skip out, but if there's any other discussion on this, happy to hear it. Yeah, and if you guys have uh, any other questions, you know, as you digest some of this a little bit more, definitely feel free to uh, reach out to us, email some of your questions if you uh, are interested in. We'd definitely love to talk about the action plan more and um, where things are going with it as well. I have one question, um, the State Forest Action Plan being such a thorough document um, could be a bit intimidating for some folks to kind of sort through on their own. I'm curious if there's anything in the works to do like a, a debrief. I mean, you gave a great overview of the document itself, but is, is there anything coming forward that is more tangible for folks to look at? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's a it's a pretty lengthy document. Um, but yeah, we kind of, you know, we worked hard on the table of contents area and kind of the 
uh, roadmap section as well at the beginning of the document to make it a little bit easier for people to walk through. Um, but yeah, we definitely can set up if people or organizations are interested, um, you know, reaching out and having separate presentations and uh, things like that um, to be able to go over some of the things more clearly that are within the document and where uh, more interest might be. So yeah, that's definitely something that we would be able to do for sure. Thank you. And we have another hand raise. That's Kristen Maestro from New Jersey Audubon. Yeah, thanks, Courtney and Lauren. And I recognize that we're past the 4 p.m. So hopefully this can be, um, hopefully won't have too much um, discussion. But I did want to just go a little bit further into detail about the proforestation and how that might be, um, you know, how that might be handled in some of the, the final review and the, the comments, and, you know, and incorporating some of those comments because. You know, I think one of the things that that um, New Jersey Audubon had submitted was uh, the issues with, you know, the concept of proforestation lacking um, peer reviewed, you know, peer reviewed backings. And so um, just curious, like how that might how that might be addressed and, you know, and if if, um, you know, if it's going to just go into where that might be most appropriate and within New Jersey and how that concept is actually going to be used. Yeah, so um, kind of like how I was uh, uh, explaining to John. So a lot of what we tried to do was to recognize that there was um, definitely a stark difference between, um, you know, a lot of uh, the arguments with proforestation. So we wanted to recognize that it was an issue within the action plan. But again, we also uh, wanted to strictly focus on a lot of the good science-based information that's uh, available surrounding some of these arguments. So yeah, that's that's kind of where we are right now. Hopefully um, that answers your question a little bit better there. Yeah, thanks. All right, anyone else have anything to add? I just saw, um, I just stuck into the chat to thank everyone for coming. Let us know. We're hoping to get everyone together in the fall, knowing that some of some things are moving forward and certainly an outdoor option. But of course, with the COVID world and our virtual adaptations, I'm sure we'll offer some virtual options as well. Um, we kind of have this grand idea of doing some sort of professional conclave, not letting all the students have all the fun. So that's kind of in my pie in the sky idea of what I would love to see come together. So if not for fall of 21, then maybe for spring of 20. Um, but definitely stay tuned for more information. And um, thank you to all of our presenters today. Really some great stuff to get us thinking about um, for stewardship in New Jersey and managing our resources. Um, I wanted to also just point out Eric's suggestion that if you have a friend, a colleague, someone who maybe hasn't joined one of our Wildlife Society meetings or might be interested in joining, serving on the board, it's been a pleasure. So we're certainly interested to hear more and see more folks at the next one. So thank you so much.